Okay. Now let's go to bat. Have you got your seatbelts fastened? We're going to travel faster than the astronauts. We're going to cover 38,500 miles. Now, here are some of the cities that we'll visit. Most of them on this map are from the tops of the Andes toward the Pacific. That does not mean that there are not giant cities everywhere they turn, off in the jungle areas to the right of the tops of the Andes. But because the western coast of Peru and some of Chile is just as much a desert as the Sahara, it's easier to excavate there, and so, of course, there are, is more work done. Eighteen miles south of Lima, Peru, we'll start with a giant 25-story Temple of the Sun at Pachacamac. Why do they call it Pachacamac? Because the God, who was the Son of God and visited these people, got out of a bird ship offshore, uh, probably a sailing vessel, they called it a bird ship, stepped over the side of the ship and walked on top of the water to shore. And so they call him he who can walk on water, Pachacamac. And so he came over to this beautiful temple of the sun. I'm way up here now on about the 24th story, pointing out some of the rather uh, poor coating work of this building, but once you get down to the stone, it's just beautifully done. There are square holes above and below where I'm crouched, where water came out. Uh, this water came from 42 miles back in the Andes to come into this ancient city. Flying north now. Get your arithmetic going. We're going to figure the size of this giant city. It runs 38 miles along the Pacific, one continuous ancient city. It's an average of 20 miles deep back into the Andes. 20 times 78, or 20 times 38 is what? 700? I didn't hear you. 760, 760 square miles in one city. That makes Los Angeles look like a little village, doesn't it? Now, right in the heart of this ancient city, are these giant walls, well, in fact, everywhere we look, 42 feet high, and these on the right, 15 feet thick at the base, 5 feet thick at the top, and they are poured adobe. Isn't that amazing? Now, let's take a close-up of that building left of center. All of this design work on all their beautiful buildings here originally were covered with thinly hammered gold leaf. Vandals broke in here before the government got hep to protecting it. They did two things. They stole the gold for its monetary value, and they destroyed many of these gorgeous designs. However, this one to the left of center, you see it running off here as you go upward, it's going off to the right. In Mitla, Mexico, in a close-up shot, we have a design that's just identical to that. And everywhere we look, we find that these were basically one and the same people as Dr. Gann, Dr. Thompson, and many other scientists testify. The same uh, geometric designs, the same hammered gold, the same feathered serpent insignia of their god, the same copper tools, hardened copper tools, and everywhere we look we find they were basically one and the same. South America, Central America, North America. Now, I'd gone in a giant museum, and uh, there were 16 very large rooms, each room, oh, maybe a little smaller than this cultural hall. But packed from floor to ceiling were the artifacts of the ancient people that once lived at this giant city that they now call Chon Chon for the one of its real name. You're probably aware that they didn't... Uh, have the key to breaking down the proper names or the personal names in all these ruins. And so scientists today have given them names that someday will tie in, I'm positive, with the Book of Mormon city names when they get the key. As I went out of this uh, museum, I was crying crocodile tears because the guide thought my camera equipment looked too professional, and uh, she wouldn't let me take pictures without a signed certificate from the president of the nation of Peru. And as I was going out, she took pity on me and uh, said, come back, Senor Oeste, that's Mr. West in Spanish, uh, solamente una, just one. And she opened the safe and I gasped. 
This is pure gold work. You put the crown on up here in the center. Now your head almost goes down through your shoulder blades because of the weight. That's pure gold. You have four feathers sticking out of the crown when you put these two that have been separated back on the crown. And I was real thrilled to see one of the evidences of proof of so-called ridiculous statement uh, number two, where it said they wrote on gold in a form of Egyptian hieroglyphic, but had a Hebrew background. Everywhere we turn amongst these people, they worship the one God of the Hebrews until long, long after the last great battle, when they turned back to heathen worship again, a thousand years later, uh, worshiping heathen gods. But around the outer edges of these feathers, the scientists tell us, are hieroglyphic carvings similar to the ancient pictorial writing in the very, very ancient Egyptian. Isn't that interesting? Now, here we have a highway off to the left. You who are close enough can see it running from the left lower corner, straight as a string, down the coast here. Can you see it? Now, that's part of over 4,000 miles of ancient highway that has been uh, excavated from place to place, starting at uh, Ecuador in the north and uh, going on down into Chile on the south. They haven't come to the end of that highway on either end. It goes up to 21,000 at one point, comes back down to the coast, and back up again with its perfect hairpin turns and and uh, engineered gradients as we could do with our best instruments today. At the mouth of the Santa, when I was flying up to Chan Chan out of Lima, I said to my pilot, be sure to point out the mouth of the Santa on the way up. Bless his heart, he forgot to do it. And uh, on the way back, I, I was up in the co-pilot seat with him this time, being a pilot myself, and I said to him, now, Darn you, if you pass the mouth of the Santa again, I'm going to have to come back with a helicopter. I want a picture of the giant wall of Peru. And he said, what giant wall of Peru? And I said, don't you know about that? And he said, no, I've flown this run for many years, and I didn't know about it. Well, he almost passed it again. Here's the Santa, starting over at the lower right-hand portion quarter of the shot, the dark gash coming straight across the slide, and opening here at the mouth, right at the Pacific Ocean. Now, we're flying at 18,000 elevations, so you can't see that wall without binoculars. I immediately dashed over to his side of the cockpit, and with binoculars could see that wall running from the junction of the Santa River mouth and the Pacific, straight as a string, back to the foothills of the Andes, and then it started following the contours of the Andes. Now, I had talked to scientists that had helped excavate some of that wall. It's as high as 32 feet high, a three-story building in height. It is wide enough on the top to say nothing of the base. It slopes toward the base. But on top alone, it's wide enough to drive two giant dump trucks up there side by side with no danger of falling off. And in the upside, as the Indians call it, uh, on the left as you're looking from the Pacific, there are forts built into that wall every so often. Now, in the Book of Mormon, when I read, as you did, about the uh, fortified cities of the Nephites, where they fortified their cities against the Lamanites, I visualized a little wall of some kind around a village. I didn't dream of a giant thing like this. The scientists in our day would trace over 400 miles back into the Andes, and they haven't come to the end of it yet. Now another shot. We've come another direction out of Lima, Peru. We've flown over the top of Arequipa. When the scientists and when our present-day engineers in amazement say to the Indians, why do we find tens of thousands of mountains terraced from bottom to top going clear up to as high as 21,000 elevation? And the Indians shrug and they say, answer real simple. Our ancient people had to have place to farm. And so they say to them, oh, why didn't you farm the level areas down here? Too many people living down in level areas. Well, now the natural next question, and people from uh, the roundabout way of San Jose and the hill country and 
San Francisco, why didn't you live on the mountainsides and still farm the easy place to farm? Don't like to live on mountainsides. And so here we have terraced mountains by the tens of thousands, and the payoff is that every single level is irrigatable with ancient pipelines, and yet nobody knows the source of the water. Now, down in the heart of La Paz is a beautiful uh, anthropology museum. And was I ever delighted to meet these two fellows left of center? Let me introduce you. This one immediately left of center is an elephant. Guess where he was found? In a human burial ground of the ancient people at Tijuanaco, Bolivia. That probably proves that there were ancient elephants here concurrently with ancient man. Wouldn't you say? And then the far left is his cousin, a mastodon, found in the same burial ground. Now, this giant uh, skeleton running the full length of this very large room, can you guess what he is? A whale. See the great big head off here to the far right? He's a whale. And uh, this may prove there was a flood once upon a time. Do you know where he was found? 12,000 feet above sea level. The water got at least that high, didn't it? Now, when we talk to the Indians about this, they aren't at all surprised. They say our ancient people brought a book from the old continent that told about a very, very foolish people uh, who uh, uh, were so wicked that it tempted our Father in heaven, God, or the Great Spirit as they sometimes call him, to destroy all the people of the earth except one family. They knew all about the great flood, and yet the very first Catholic priests who came amongst them were amazed the minute they could understand each other in sign language and in pidgin language, for instance, to hear them telling these intimate, detailed stories of the Old Testament uh, that they claimed they got from a book they brought from the old continent. Now, did they have hardened copper tools? Oh, you better believe it. These are not just tools. These are hardened copper surgical instruments. They had some of the greatest surgeons that this world has ever known. Now, I, I chuckle every time I think about the holes in the head of the male skull. Uh, I tell the Indian women that their foremothers must have had spikes in their rolling pins. <laughs> We very, very, very seldom see a hole in the cranial remains of a female skeleton, but we find holes in the head of the males everywhere we turn. And when, uh, when we ask the Indians how come, they say that uh, in some of their wars they used war clubs with spikes that uh, kind of damaged the male skulls pretty badly. Now, not only did they save people's lives who had... Uh, indented skulls and pressing on their brains, but they were able to, to bevel the edge of the bone with a beautiful sloping bevel, beautifully cut, and then the next thing we don't understand. We can't do it today. We don't know how they did it. They reverse ground a piece of silver so perfectly fit that when you put it in that opening in the skull, you can run your hand over the skull with your eyes closed and you can't tell where the bone ended and where the silver began. So perfect is the fit. Now they countersunk screws that fit down into the bone and held the silver plate in place. They have slots in the heads. They have beveled heads so that they'll fit down flush with the surface of the silver. They have threads, but they're neither the SAE thread or the standard thread that we use today. Nevertheless, threads. Does it look like they had machinery? Does it appear that they were able to harden pure copper? Many of these tools are pure copper or these surgical instruments. And how hard are they? Our finest files won't even scratch them. It takes a grinding stone to uh, uh, sharpen those tools. Now, after Drs. Grania Reyes and Esteban Roca, two of the greatest surgeons of Lima, Peru, had for the first time used those ancient surgical instruments on a live patient. They said their ancient instruments and methods are as good as ours and in some ways better. Now here's the, one of my long lost cousins of the tribe of Joseph and 
My son, Jack Jr., from uh, the Brazilian Mission, and my wife, that's a good-looking better street quarters over there, uh, who are with us. You'll see a lot of us in the shots. We had delayed action features, and so don't pay too much attention to that. Now, we've gone on a... Hold this just a second, Bishop. We've gone on a 12-hour train ride to end all train rides um, with the Indian people. And we went on an overnight trip across the highest navigatable lake in the world, Lake Titicaca, 12,000 feet elevation. And now we have come down to the capital of the ancient Incas, and then out by automobile, almost into the little town of Pisac down here, and here's one of the Indian girlfriends going down to market. Here are ancient terraces in this area, a whole city of the ancient people up in this area that has not been completely excavated. Okay, now we can go. I told the bishop to just keep showing me as fast as he could or I'd talk all night. How about questions? If you got any, just break in. Uh, here's the Cusco kid here with a cap on. And uh, my son down here bargain bargaining with one of the Indians. I nearly got shot when I came out of Bolivia without some product of Bolivia. Uh, because my wife and son had brought something out of every nation. That's quite a display in itself. We were in and out of 29 nations. The headwaters of the Amazon River. We had flown across 2,000 miles of the mouth of this river. And now here we came to the very headwaters. This is the breaking point between flow to the Pacific and flow to the Atlantic. I'm trying to commit suicide here. Uh, that's 34 stories, approximately, straight down there. The ancient people have built this fortress called Ollantaytambo in the valley of the Orabamba River. And here they had not only a fortress, but the terraces were irrigatable so that they could grow crops and use it as a retreat as well. Stone pipelines again came into this area. These are some of the smaller stones that these fellows worked with. Giant things weighing hundreds of tons in some cases, and they're so beautifully fit to other stones attached to them that without the use of any mortar, you can't get the blade of a penknife between the joints anywhere you try. And every stone is interlocked with knobs and crevices and interlocking joints with the stones around it. Now, from way up on the mountain, Jack and I climbed up there to get a shot from one of the lookout towers at the face of the... Uh, main fort here. You begin to get an idea of the size when you realize that a man can walk in this doorway without stooping. Now here we have some of the interlocking features. Over the entire surface of these many stones was one stone so perfectly fit in reverse pattern that when it's put over the top of this, nowhere can the scientists get uh, a thin blade in between. The minute they put a blade anywhere in this whole surface, it raises up the whole stone. Now, we can't do that kind of work today. We could pour, we could make a mold and then pour some molten material in there and make a reverse pattern. But these people were able to do it with stone cutting. Now, way up over a 13,000 foot path to get a shot of some of the highland road work of the ancient people. This is one of their ancient roads. Embedded in these rough stones are still signs of asphalt. The topping of asphalt long since has been cut away by the feet of millions of sheep and cattle of the Indian people. Along the edges uh, were the beautifully cut and fit stones which are lying down in the uh, gully here now. The highway is always raised from 2 to 12 feet above the surrounding area to keep it dry. Did you notice the center line down that highway? made out of rock. Uh, now we're over at uh, uh, oh, Pancho Mache, that isn't right. I, I can't think of this one. Uh, it, it ends in Mache, and they call it the Inca Bath. Here again, these large stones look like they have gaps here, but they curved each stone as it came in toward the other stone. But the minute the two stones met, Never could you even get a needle in between the joints, and no mortar used. Okay? And now here you have an evidence of how they worked into the original stone. Here's some original stone of the mountain. They fit the cut stone so perfectly to it 
that again, no joints are gapping. And underneath these two spouts of water uh, was a unit that's as near like one of our baptismal fonts as we could make. Steps going down into the water, about the same depth as our baptismal font, and the clear water coming right out of the mountain spring. They told us that they had guards to keep anybody out of that area because only religious customs and ceremonies were performed. Now hold this one just a minute. You remember reading in the Book of Mormon that Mosiah and others were able to stand on great towers and speak to many people at once. Now, some have said that surely they couldn't have been speaking to more than a few hundred people at a time. But time and time again, in the ruins of the ancient people, we came across a condition like here at this area. Here we found acoustics so perfect that standing on this tower, with a valley completely surrounding it, and with giant mountains in turn surrounding the valley, I got my son, Jack, who didn't know any better. I tricked him once in a while, you see. He's a few years younger. And I said, how about running back down this road, clear back here to this bend? <laughs> here's, here's a yama, an Indian yama, and an Indian and another yama right here to get an idea of how far back that is. Now, he ran back there, and I shouted to him, can you hear me? And he yelled back, and he said, it sounds like thunder. Talk lower. I finally got down to a whisper. And I said, can you hear me now? And he yelled back to me and he said, I can hear just as clearly as if you were by my side. Now, the reason that made me curious about this was that as we came down out of uh, Ponchu Mache, up here in the ruin of the Inca Bath, in the automobile, I heard a flute playing. It sounded very loud. And I asked the Indian to stop the automobile, our guide. And I said, where in the world is that flute? It was beautiful music. And as we got out of the automobile and looked around, he grinned and he said, that probably is over at uh, the ruin of Saxa Walmart. I said, where in the world is that? He said, that's five miles away. <laughs> and I said, great Scott, you don't mean it. And he said, well, the acoustics up here are very, very interesting. Well, then when I got over here, I wanted to try it, and that was the experience. I believe that they could seat several hundred thousand people around the rim of this mountain, and every one of them be able to hear one speaker on this tower. Just an interesting little sideline. Okay. And now here's another tiny stone. This is in the ruin of Saxahuaman. And sure enough, over here we found a little Indian kid who was playing a flute when we got over here. Uh, here's a, a stone, a single stone, 27 feet high, 14 feet in diameter, 12 feet thick. It weighs over 300 tons. The scientists tell us they found the quarry from whence it came 26 miles away over very mountainous country. We're up about 14,000 foot elevation here at this Saxahuaman fort. The fort is built in a zigzag pattern so that they can keep their enemy in crossfire no matter from which side they approach. And if they storm the first wall 30 feet high, they have another wall to storm 30 feet high. They storm that one, they've got a third one 30 feet high to storm. And then above that are four minor terraces of this fortress. It covers the whole top of one giant mountain. Now this is a real car, that isn't a toy. Gives you an idea of the size of this. Now the payoff is this. Scientists have traced the pipelines that come into this area for five miles. They lost it when it went down into a stone mountain. The pipeline is made of two sections of stone fit together so perfectly in units that without mortar, it doesn't leak water. Now, I had to see that to believe it. And the water lines completely interlace the whole structure, and we have tunnels going from the top of this down to the ancient uh, Inca, cause the ancient Inca temples or palaces down in the valley of Cusco. Now, in 1950, a terrible earthquake in Cusco almost completely destroyed that ancient capital of the Incas. It's habit inhabited today by modern-day people as well as Indians. But wherever they built on the ancient foundations, the earthquake didn't even budge those foundations. Here this structure above built by present-day man is completely demolished. The ancient foundation hardly touched, just a little gap there and here and one down here. Otherwise, it's completely unharmed. 
Now, doesn't that baby take your breath away? We traveled on the auto carrel of the Indians. It's a bus that runs on railroads, uh, railroad tracks, uh, to the ruins of Cusco, way up in the very tops of this hazy mountain right here. It's 2,400 feet almost sheer drop from the top of that mountain down to the valley of the Urabamba River. And uh, as we go up there, it'll scare, scare you to death when you visualize that you're looking down the equivalent of 240 stories. Now, they terrace this thing, as you see. Each level is irrigatable again. And as I got the story three days after, uh, or in Lima, Peru, after we got out of here, three days after we were in here, way down in this valley, a scientist was talking with an old Indian fellow. And he said to the Indian, uh, any more ruins around here in Spanish? And the Indian said, plenty. And he said, you haven't found the great city of, uh, of Machu Picchu yet. Well, the scientist said, sure, we've found it. You mean Huano Picchu. There's another giant city up on top of here. Can you see the ribs of the terraces? Now, there's a trail leading from the one city to the other, and the scientist said, yes, we found Juano Picchu. And the old boy said, no, not Juano Picchu, otra direction, the other direction. And sure enough, he went up there with some Indians, cut their way through the tree growth, and when they got up in there, they found another giant city just three miles on up the mountain from Machu Picchu. Now, here are some of these pipelines, again used in this ruin. First stone they pay little attention to cutting a, a perfect half circle in it. They don't pay much attention to the uh, working of the face there. Then the next stone, if, for instance, this were the one that was going to match with this, they very, very carefully work this one in, in reverse pattern. How in the world they do it, we don't know. But every tiny crevice, indentation, or rise of this face is exactly matched in reverse with the other face. When they put them together, they fit so tightly that water won't leak out of the joints. And the Indian care caretakers of this ancient city are still using water from those pipelines right to this day. Now we've flown out of uh, Machu Picchu area in Cusco back to Lima and have gone up by automobile to the Cajamarquia ruins. Here, several hundred thousand people occupied an ancient city that stretches for miles. And most people don't know that even the water that comes into Lima, Peru today for the modern city there of over a million people comes through ancient canals 42 miles out of the mountains. Again, stonework so beautifully done that we couldn't top it today, and it's as perfectly engineered as we could do with our finest instruments. Now, we are north of the narrow neck for the first time, and here we have some real interesting things. Pure white Indians. When I talked to my chief guide in uh, the Swank El Panama Hotel in Panama City, I said to him, can you get me a guide to take me into the white Indians of Darien? He was a white man. And he looked at me like I was pulling his leg. And he said, uh, you aren't serious. And I said, well, I never was more serious in my life. Oh, he said, I've heard that legend for years, but there aren't any white Indians in there. And I said, that isn't the question. I want to know if you can get me a guide to take me into the Darien Peninsula. Oh, he said, sure, that's no problem, but I don't want you to be disappointed. I wasn't. There are 2,000 pure white Indians in this one Tula tribe of the Darien Peninsula alone. When the scientists found these people, they took four of them out to, of all unlikely places, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. And there, for many days, the finest experts we could get in the world, anthropologists, MDs, surgeons, checked these Indians from stem to stern, so to speak. And strange enough, they came away with a unanimous decision. These are indeed pure white Indians. All the same legends of the Indians, all the same bonal characteristics and structure, the high cheekbones, as you can see, the, the same blood types of the Indians. Now, I thought for a long time this was an Indian boy. And one of our own missionaries had to straighten me out on it. When I was in here, there were no missionaries at all. And since then, uh, in the last 20 years, our missionaries have been able to go in here. And these white Indians are being converted by the hundreds. 
And he said, Jack, uh, didn't you realize that they never put a ring through the nose of a boy? I thought it was always the boy who was led around with a ring in his nose by the girls. Isn't that mean? And he said they never put a tattoo mark down over the bridge of a boy's nose, a boy baby. It's always the girls. Now, she looks like she has Mongol-type eyes, doesn't she? That isn't true. She's simply squinting because of the brightness of the sun. Never colorless skin like an albino, but beautiful uh, pinkish cast skin. Never white hair like an albino, but golden or brown hair. Never pink eyes, but beautiful blue or brown eyes. And the strain is so deep it continues to crop up. Now, the amazing thing. They have a legend that in very ancient times, their people were almost annihilated by their dark-skinned brothers in a giant war in the land of many waters. Their legend goes on to say that those white Indians who would deny Christ as their personal savior were not put to death. They further testify that some of their people escaped into the wilderness southward exactly as Moroni said, the last writer in the Book of Mormon. But he assumed that those white Indians had been hunted down and killed, but he wasn't an eyewitness to that. And now we find that some of them did escape. They had to fortify themselves for many decades against their dark-skinned brother. They finally got so they could come out and live with him. Then when Cortez did so many dastardly things to the Indian people in the name of Christianity, they turned against their own white people. And once again, they had to go back and fortify themselves. Comparatively recently, they've got so they can come back out now and live with their dark-skinned brother. Up in the highlands of Guatemala, the only place I ever felt like a, a giant, these women averaged three foot three in height, and the men averaged four feet in height. And uh, yet there's one little Indian fellow under this great load of earthenware pottery. I tried to lift two of those pots, and they're real heavy. And yet he thought nothing at all of strapping that thing on his back with a tote strap walking over these high Guatemala mountains. Every stone in these steps is held to its neighbor by the finest quality cement I've ever seen in my life. I'd give everything in this world I had if I could patent the ancient cement. So much superior is it to what we have today. It just clings like glue. I'll tell you a story about that in a few minutes. Now, we've... Uh, had to, I say we, I had to come in here alone. When Jack Jr. and Lorona saw what I was going to have to go through to get into Copan, City of the Dead, they said, if you're crazy enough to go, uh, go ahead, but somebody has to stay out to make a living. So they wouldn't go into Copan with me in 1953. I uh, hired six different pilots, changed planes six times, and we made 12 landings on eight of which we had no airstrip. We'd simply land in clearings that the Indians had made to plant some crops. And uh, we'd have to buzz every field to get the animals off of it, the, the cows and the horses, because uh, they were loaded in these pastures. So we'd buzz the field and then come in, and, and it was a little bit sloppy as we came in for a landing in those plains. Now, when I said to my sixth pilot, how far will I have to hike to get into the giant city of Copan? And he said to me... Uh, Jack, do you want to land right in the city square? And I said, oh, my heavens, could we? And he said, I think so. Now get that think, Bart. <laughs> Later, when I was taking multi-engine training down at Oxnard, my pilot instructor hit the master switch by mistake, and we were going down like a rock. Uh, I was all lined up for a landing in one of those sandy road areas of the uh, grape vineyards down there at Oxnard, and just before we touched down, he had been frantically trying to get one of the engines started. He got one to catch, and then he got another one going, and he said, let's get out of here. And when he got up to where he could breathe again, I turned over and looked at him, and he was just wringing wet with sweat. He looked over at me disgustingly, and he said, Jack, doesn't anything scare you? And I said, not anymore. I've been scared by experts. I... <laughs> flown with these jungle pilots for years. <laughs> and he said, you were going to land this thing, weren't you? And I said, you better believe it. Didn't you intend for me to? And he said, heavens no. I hit that master switch by mistake. 
Well, uh, these jungle pilots, they were pretty uh, great guys, but they were daredevils. When we came in for a landing, the jungle trees ducked as we came down. And when he stopped, his props were right up against the jungle growth in the far end of the courtyard. Now, they've stood up so many of these steelies that were lying down that I guess we really couldn't land in that area now. Uh, Jack Jr. was down there just a few weeks ago with a whole plane load of tourists. And uh, he said, Dad, that whole courtyard is just filled with these steelies. Now, how hard is this stone? It's so hard that every stone tool they could find in this area, and yes, they find stone tools, was broken to powder trying to just cut a groove down a chalk mark that one of the scientists made in one of these stone uh, units. And yet look how intricately the ancient people carved them. Every inch of it, back, front, and sides is carved. Notice the trees growing over the top of these buildings that haven't yet been excavated. Now, I'm not this fast a 10-second man. I have a 10-second delayed action feature on my camera. But I got my pilot to take this picture, or, or got the caretaker here, I mean, while I was waiting for my pilot to come back. I'm standing on the steps of the famous pyramid of Copan that uh, Dr. Jones writes about in his book on ancient America. And to our amazement, we find on every face of every step on this temple, hieroglyphic carving somewhat similar to ancient pictorial writing of guess who? The Egyptian people. Again, at the base of the steps is a feathered lip of a serpent. Can you see it here above a human tooth? I'll show you a close-up in a minute. Let's see if I can clear that any for you. Whoop, that's worse. Yeah, that's, a l whoop. that's a little better, isn't it? Now, there's a rounding head here in the base of the picture to the right. When you put this rounding head on top of the flat surface over here at the foot of the steps, you now have a perfect serpent's head. Around the back of the head are feathers done in stone. Going up the steps are 12 other serpents, all feathered serpents. Let's take a close-up. Isn't this amazing? Can you see the front tooth of a human's mouth and the ribs like a, a scale of a serpent there on the lips? And can you see the, one of the other 12 serpents up here? And do you notice that he has human teeth at the very top center of the picture? Again, we say to the Indians, why did you use the serpent for your son of God insignia? That's a sign of Satan. And they say that's the sign of the younger brother of the Son of God, who was the one who came to this continent. The older brother, who was Jesus Christ, had a younger brother whose name was Lucifer, and they tell us all about this story of Lucifer being cast out of heaven. They know all about it from the background they brought from the old continent. Now, they say when you put feathers or wings on the serpent, now he becomes an angel of wisdom and mercy with very great healing power. Sakuleo. I didn't even hope to land here, but again, the pilot said, oh, we can land anywhere down there, and down he went like a rock in a DC-3 cargo plane. We got down all in one piece because there's my pilot standing on the step. I have one son trained as an engineer, another trained as a, an architect, and the engineer said to me, Dad, these ancient people had very modern structural lines in their temples, didn't they? And I said, well, maybe that's not the right terminology, Bob, but they certainly did have beautiful structures. Maybe history is repeating itself. Now, isn't it interesting? In 1830, when our people said to their neighbors, we believe the Book of Mormon is the second witness for Christ, we think it is the running mate spoken of by Ezekiel in 37, 15 through 19, that it is the stick of Joseph from the western continent to match the stick of Judah from the eastern continent or the Holy Bible. And uh, they said that this book said that the people had an Egyptian background, that they wrote in Egyptian. And their neighbors were up in arms. And they said, why, that's crazy. How could they be Egyptian at the same time as they're Hebrew and be of all places on this western continent? Yet here we have it. 
uh, pyramids in the one case there at Copan, that one on the stairway of the hieroglyphics is identical in base measurement right to the foot with the largest pyramid of Egypt. And yet here we have the worship of the Hebrews. Never do they build a pyramid on the Americas to a peak. Always before they reach the high point, they cut it off. And on the level part up there, they build a gorgeous temple where they do their worshiping. And when we ask them why, they say, our people brought a book from the old continent. Here it goes again in the legend. And it told about a very foolish people who built a building, a tower, to walk to heaven. And they knew all about the spiral stairway on it, for instance. And God got angry at them and made their language go jabber, jabber. We don't want him to get angry at us. And so uh, we, therefore, uh, cut off our pyramids before we reach the highest point so he won't misunderstand our intentions. And then we doubly ensure it by building a beautiful temple up there and doing our worshiping up on top. Terrifically expensive work. They've taken the trees off of this building in the background. Now they use picks and shovels until they hit some of the ancient work, as you can see up at the top of the slide. The minute they hit any, anything ancient, they throw the picks and shovels away and go to brooms, finally to whisk brooms, a very tedious and costly method of excavation. Yet look at this map of Mexico and Central America. And in the Americas before Columbus on the fly leaf, it says of this map, a few of over 2,000 city sites known to scientists in this area alone. Now, did they have terrifying destruction in ancient times? Everywhere we look is evidence of it. Off the coast of Honduras, for instance, can you see this structure out here that the artist has put out in the black water? This is the spot where one of our American colleges has spent over a million dollars building a seawall semicircular out into the water. Then they pumped the interior dry, and sure enough, what they suspected was true. There's a whole giant city swept off into the depths of the sea by what must have been an ancient uh, tidal wave. Now, in this area, here's where we were at Copan. Can you see it on the map? You are, who are close enough? Quirigua here, and Utatlan. And uh, many of these cities we'll visit in these trips. This giant city of Palenque, one street, 24 miles in length, and they haven't come to the end of the buildings on either end. Another street, 18 miles, crossing it. Now, that's 18 times 24. That's a pretty good-sized city itself, isn't it? Up here at Uxmal and Isimal, and uh, these cities, Chichen Itza, we'll visit these cities. Way up here, uh, almost on the coast, is a giant of giant cities, and it wasn't discovered until 10 years ago. My son visited that city just a, a few weeks ago, and he said, Dad, you got to get down there. That's just out of this world, and we'll tell you more about that as we go. Up in this area, where Mexico City is today, one giant mountain, Matahusco, belched forth her living fire in the year Sekali, according to the chronology uh, breakdown of the ancient calendar, H.H. H. Bancroft, the historian, in his five giant volumes, Native Races, said this was the same year that Christ was crucified on the cross on the old continent, 33 A.D. Mount Ahusko belched forth her living fire in that same year, covered 12 cities that lay in the path, many of them to a depth of 30 feet. In this area, there is a street sticking straight out of the ground, as though an earthquake had opened up the earth. A street and a building fell off into the gash in the earth. Then the earth closed, crushing the building flat. As it was lying flat, it was crushed. And now the street is sticking straight out of the ground. What's the street made out of? The finest quality cement this world has ever seen. Yes, everywhere we turn is evidence. Let's recap. Do we have evidence? that there were two main groups? Yes, we do. Because this pyramid right here in the center of the picture at Ushmal has a core that goes back to the time of the Tower of Babel. The second people saved some work when they built their stone and cement building over the top of that uh, mound of the very ancient people that the scientists call the Archaics. 
Are you people getting cold? Okay, all right, I didn't want you to freeze. I can feel a pretty good breeze coming through here. But it's, uh, it feels good when you've been in this jungle area. <laughs> now, these highways, from Guatemala to Merida, we flew hundreds and hundreds of miles. And again, since I'm a pilot, the, the uh, pilot let me come up and sit in the co-pilot seat with him. I pointed out a gash in the jungle. We were in an area where there are no modern-day tribes that we know of. At least we don't know of any in there. I'm sure there's some there. But as I looked through the binoculars and handed them to him, he said, why, that is an ancient highway, isn't it? He could tell that the growth of the jungle was much less dense in this area where the highway was and that the vines were apparently just stretching across the highway. Now, how far did that gash in the jungle run? We traced it 125 miles, straight as a string, and when he took a bearing on it, it was running true north, not magnetic north, but due true north. How long is the highway that interlinks all of these giant cities? Well, when, when uh, this wonderful fellow T.A. Willard wrote his book called The City of the Sacred Well, uh, we thought that these roads were just very short. Now the scientists tell us that they have traced with helicopters and airplanes this same highway not running down one coast but zigzagging in and, all the great, in and out of all the great and lesser cities of the Yucatan, Mexico, Central America. How long is it? over 4,000 miles in length, and everywhere they excavated, it's covered with that fine quality cement. We're crouched, I'm crouched now in the great quadrangle of Ushmal. Let's take some other shots. Isn't this gorgeous work? Everything on this building means something to the Indians today. Uh, this wonderful fellow, uh, Dr., uh, mm, what's his name that has built buildings up here in the United States, identical copies of some of the ancient buildings. I'll probably think of his name in a minute. I can't think of it right now. He's made millions in duplicating these buildings. And he says that they were some of the finest architects the world has ever known. This building in the background is not sitting on top of the one in the center. That's about a block and a half behind it, and it's eight stories in height as we would count stories today. It's the temple of the dwarf at Ushmal. And they say that the dwarf had mother-in-law trouble. I can't imagine that. I had the greatest mother-in-law this world ever produced. But apparently he had some trouble with her. And so he built separate quarters for her around behind the pyramid, where the face of it, I'll show you later, is a gorgeous thing. <laughs> uh, now, looking at this building off in the distance there, that's the only one of the four buildings around the quadrangle that has the feathered serpent insignia. Can you see the serpent's head right center? And his body going off to the left, going behind the facade, intertwining with another serpent's body way over on the far left, and then returning at the top of the slide, dipping down, crossing over, and the rattle's almost at the head. Do you see it? And we say to the Indians, where do you get the feathers on this serpent? Well, they say, don't you see the jar sitting on the tail? And can't you see the spout of water coming out of the jar? And the spout ends in feathers. Sure enough, there it is, the feathered serpent. They call him Talalik, the rain god. And everywhere we look, it has the elephant trunk on the mask of the rain god Talalik. Isn't this amazing? This structure is uh, 200 feet long just to the center. This is the center doorway here in the right part of the slide. I didn't have a wide angle lens and couldn't get the full length of that palace of the governor. There are 22,000 separately cut and beautifully fit stones in the mosaic pattern that they use down in South America so much, and they're wedged in between two heavy ribs, one over the doorway, one at the roof line up here. 22,000 separately cut and fit stones without a bit of adhesive on the backer sides. They're just wedged in place, and the fit is so perfect that there they've stayed all these centuries, 2,500 years, with the jungle growing right over the top. 
How'd you like to climb things like that to do your worshiping? Uh, this fellow with a white shirt is my guide for this area, and I said, if you can climb that, I can too. So I went up there, and I got uh, up toward the top of the uh, pyramid, and I happened to look back, and that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> those risers are 12 inches high, and the tread is 6 inches, just the opposite of what most of our stairways are. So it's like climbing a ladder. They got a chain over here at the center to protect uh, sissies like I am from falling off. I'm pointing to a hole the Mexican government cut in the pyramid. Down at the base of the steps on the left, you see this doorway? Let's go inside, and sure enough, the typical condition is true. There are pyramids inside of pyramids. Isn't this gorgeous work? Three pyramids inside the outer pyramid here at the dwarf at Ushmal. Now, did they have machinery? You who are close enough will be able to see a break in the stone right here. Do you see the cement joint up here? And this is a solid stone now, running up, taking in the body of the serpent above and these urns. Now, coming off to the left, a little left of center, do you see another joint right here? And as it goes up, can you see the difference in color? of the stone in this urn and its neighbor off to the left. Now, they not only cut this extremely hard stone with um, a lathe that is a stone-cutting type of lathe, but they made a half-circle cut here on the left, came around to the halfway point, then started another half-circle, one of the hardest things to do with a stone-cutting lathe, another half-circle, another half-circle, all in the same giant stone. The one above. This shiny surface in the serpent's body in the upper right corner and the other shiny surface, do you see it? When the engineers take those units apart, to their amazement, they'll swing in any direction like a universal joint, you engineers. And the, the pins are machined to a thousandth of an inch tolerance. You bet they had machinery. Now, down in Lima, Peru, once again, my equipment looked too uh, modern and too professional, and the professionals have to have a signed certificate from the president of the nation before they can take pictures. But they had ring gears, they had flywheel gears, ratio gears, spider gears, uh, the teeth showing signs of wear, and their hardest gears were out of pure copper, hardened copper gears. Now, for many years, hardening of copper was a lost art. When I was over in... Uh, uh, Las Vegas, and some of them joke and say I was over there retrieving some of my losses as a general contractor. That isn't true. I was over there to give the Book of Mormon lectures on the trial of the stick of Joseph. And when I was telling him about this case I defended in law school against the charge of fraud, and the Book of Mormon was the subject, and those who brought it forth, I, I remembered the experience that we had here, where scientists and engineers had said, why, the Book of Mormon is crazy. It talks about hardened copper tools amongst the people who were Stone Age people. It's ridiculous because it talks about uh, uh, the construction of giant buildings and great highways, and they couldn't even count, they told our people. And so everywhere we turn, we find evidence now that these so-called ridiculous statements aren't at all ridiculous, that they did indeed do what they said they could do. But after I'd given the lecture at Las Vegas, uh, one of the uh, people in the congregation came up to me and said, Mr. West, you made a misstatement tonight. The minute he said, Mr., I knew he wasn't a member of the church. How the dickens would I know that? Now, he said to me, uh, the art of hardening copper is no longer a lost art. And I said to him, oh, my heavens, has somebody broken that? And he said, they sure have. And I said, I handed him a card, and I said, I've got to talk to you. I need to know more about this. But I'm flying my plane out of here, and I've got to run the minute this thing's over, and I'm flying back to Los Angeles. So uh, I said, please come see me or telephone me. And so two days later, who was at my front door than this wonderful fellow from Las Vegas? And uh, two months later, he was a member of the church, and I owned his uh, copper hardening system, and they've always charged us with making a trade. <laughs> but we really didn't. Okay, let's go on now. 
We go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Here we have a building put together with sticks and strings. Do you know that these Indian huts out in the Yucatan will stand up in a 150-mile gale? They're so perfectly engineered. Here's the ridge pole up at the very top, the angling uh, struts here that go down, crisscrossing here on the rafters that come down, all with sticks and strings. A dear old Indian fellow was sitting in a hammock below this bar to the uh, bottom part of the slide from center. When uh, my guide walked into this hut, I'm going to have to keep showing pictures as I tell you about this. He just walked in and pointed to this dear old Indian fellow and said, he's what you would call an Indian patriarch. And he said to me, you tell him the story you told me about our gold Bible. And so in my halting Spanish, I started to tell him the story of the great uh, record of this continent written on gold plates, starting by mistake in 1 Nephi, in what is the beginning of the written book, instead of over where it really begins. Uh, I told him about 1 Nephi, 2 Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jerem, Omni, and everywhere we turned, he wasn't batting an eye, no reaction. And then I got clear over in 3 Nephi where Christ, came walking down out of the heavens and talk about react. He burst into tears and he shouted at me, si es verdad, si es correcto. Yes, that's true, that's correct. And then he almost scolded me. I got a Scottish blessing in a combination of the Indian and uh, Spanish tongue for he spoke no English. And he said to me, why would you talk to me una hora and never even mention the most important thing in that record. I was waiting to see if you knew about the white God who was the Son of God and came to this continent in early times. Now, he made me promise before I left his hut that I'd send a Book of Mormon in Spanish out to Merida, and my guide promised to pick it up and take it out to him. I've never seen him since that day. Here we are at the giant pyramid at Chichen Itza. Now, this pyramid is called the Pyramid of Kuku Khan. And uh, there is a holy of holies inside. And guess what? Yes, a life-size jag jaguar, but it was a thousand years after they worshipped the one God of the Hebrews before they turned back to idolatry. He has 73 jade spots on him. He's worth a king's ransom. They locked him up real tight when they saw Jack West coming. Now, let me, uh, let me go back and recap. We started to recap. Do we have evidence now that there were two main groups? Yes, we do. Do we have evidence that they did indeed become great nations and great civilizations? You bet we do. Do we have evidence that the second people brought a book similar to the Old Testament and brought a book from the old continent? Yes, we do. Do we have evidence that they did write on gold in a form of Egyptian hieroglyphic and yet had the Hebrew background? Certainly, everywhere we turn. Do we have evidence that Christ did come to this continent? Yes, we do. Do we have evidence that they used cement, but only north of the narrow neck? Certainly we do. Nearly every building in this area is held together with the ancient cement. Now, do we have evidence that they had hardened copper tools? Yes, even surgical instruments. Do we have evidence that they had the principle of the wheel and the principles of machinery? Yes, we do. In 1830, some of the scientists, as you remember, told our people why the Indians can't even count. How could they have had giant structures and uh, marvelous engineering techniques? Now we know the ancient people could count to at least a thousand because there are exactly a thousand pillars in this temple of the thousand pillars. As you go up these steps, protected at the base by the feathered serpent insignia, this time his body sticking in the air and his tail is surmounted by feathers. His head is lying flat, each head, on the base of the stairs. But as we climb the stairs of the Temple of the Warriors and we go down three flights of stairs down inside, there on the side of a beautiful square pillar is a, an elephant shown in one case with straps running down his side to pull things, and another elephant with a basket on his uh, back to carry passengers, and a horse then in full color, shown as a beast of burden. Now, over the horizon, 
is Dizzy Chaltoon, this giant of giant cities that's been found within the last 10 years, only a little bit of it excavated. But at the base of one of their giant temples is a life-size elephant and also a life-size horse, a little bit different than our modern horse, but a horse nevertheless. And since the uh, things were done by humans, of course they were here contemporaneously with ancient man. All around the base of the Temple of the Warriors are hieroglyphic carvings similar to ancient Egyptian. The ballpark in every major city, South America, Central America, North America, the ancient ballpark is almost uh, sure to be there. A giant thing longer than a football field. The idea was to get a little rubber ball up through that ring above my head, set at right angles to a basketball ring without using your hands. If you're real clever, you flip it from your hips. Wouldn't that be something? Now, acoustics again. Up in this beautiful temple at the upper end of the field, I whispered a question to my guide way down at the other end of the field, longer than a football field away. He answered with another whisper, and we heard each other perfectly. Now, we're not up in the tops of the Andes where the air is very clear. We're now at almost sea level. And when we say to the Indians, why did your ancient people go to such fabulous extent to get these acoustics? Well, they say, can stand on this spot and shout and hear 15 distinct echoes. We tried it, and sure enough, you could. They say, answer real simple. Everybody multiplied by 15 when they yell for the home team. <laughs> Quite a sense of humor. <laughs> and so acoustics are marvelous everywhere we turn. Now, looking down this lonely jungle road over the top of the Temple of Venus here, at the end of that road is the famous sacred well of Chichen Itza. Do you see humps everywhere you look out here in the jungle? There are giant ancient buildings under every one of those humps. This uh, land is just as flat as a table until you have a building of ancient people. Now, the water is jet black and yet perfectly usable as, as household water, potable water. It's about 65 feet from the top of the jungle floor down to the water. Then the water is roughly 70 feet deep. In partial excavation with underwater lights, they brought up, guess what? A copper chisel so hard that our best files won't even scratch it. Golden discs with hieroglyphic carvings around the outer edges that scientists tell us are similar to ancient Egyptian. And yet everywhere we look are these signs of the Christian cross and the knowledge of the, of the language and the, the uh, religion of the Hebrew people. Yes, it's true. We find today the body skeletal remains of lovely maidens who a thousand years after that great last battle between the dark-skinned brother and the white-skinned brother, when the Indian people as we know them today had degenerated, just as the book had prophesied, back to the state of a savage, yes, they did turn to human sacrifice and to the worshiping of animals. I sat up all one night, a full moon night, here at uh, Chichen Itza, just enthralled as I got the feel of these ancient people. We bring these Indian guides in, and they know what everything on these buildings means. It's, it's clear to them to this day. Going from the sublime to the ridiculous again. I had hunted for this guide in the middle, Hector Arana, for a number of years. Finally, in, uh, in Merida, Bill Hernandez said, I can tell you where to find Hector, and so he took me to him. I said, Hector, will you take me into Sahil and Labna? I cheated on this slide. This was in 1951 on a previous trip. He said, sure, in Spanish. He didn't speak any English. I said, how long? Four days round trip. And uh, I said, uh, can you get away from work? Oh, yes, I work for the government. They'll never miss me. <laughs> and so in we went with this uh, square radiator Ford, 1914 vintage. I almost bawled when I saw this Ford. I owned the dead ringer for it when I was just a kid and first came to California in 1921. And we called it the M-Men Special. I helped to organize the M-Men in California. And uh, we'd pile in 10 or 15 kids in that old brass radiator Ford and away we'd go. 
The only trouble, mine didn't have any top for a long time. It was the topless wonder or the MN special. Now, the road was so narrow going into Sayil that there was no place to turn around. Finally, Hector got tired of cutting trees in two that had fallen across the narrow jungle road with his machete. And he gave up, and he said, can't go any farther. And I said, well, then, let's walk on in. He said, can't do it. And I said, why? Can't leave Lizzie. He called his brass radiator Ford Lizzie in Spanish. I said, why, you rascal, you left your wife without even a backward glance. And he said, can replace wife, can't replace Lizzie. <laughs> now, we backed out because we couldn't turn around. And we got to a place where a tunnel had been cut through the jungle. And he said, you still want to go into Sayil? And I said, I sure do. I thought he'd relented. He said, here's the trail. And I said, wonderful. Are you coming? No, have to stay with Lizzie. But he said, you go, we'll wait. I tried to get the Bill to take me in, and Bill said, Jack, I've only been in there once in my life. I wouldn't dare go in. I had to guide when I went in. So I was determined to go, and he said, don't miss only one hut on the way in. If you miss, you get lost. I said, well, wait for me, and if I'm gone more than four days, well, I send in some search parties. I got this little 14-year-old boy, Anatolio, to take me in. He spoke a brand of Spanish that I didn't understand at all. And I only speak enough Spanish to get into trouble in the first place. And, of course, I didn't understand his Indian tongue. But we walked on into Sayil, and you don't have to speak each other's language. Once you crack a joke and start laughing at each other, why, then you get along beautifully. 110 rooms in this giant structure. Five stories high, a gorgeous building. In any city we have in the world today, that would be a beautiful building. The jungle trees have been removed, part of the dirt removed, and 110 rooms to date have been taken out. Now, these pillars, one of the engineers took a pillar out of its socket. Sure enough, there was an indentation in the top and one in the bottom, just like we would hold something horizontally in a lathe, the turning lathe, to cut it. There are teeth marks in those very hard stone uh, pillars. And yet there are no two areas where there's the same diameter going up and down. They were cutting them just like we would cut a, a wood stairway balustrade today. Uh, they did this in this hard stone. You see the elephant mask down here on the corner, the rain god Talalik? You see that trunk curled up? Isn't that interesting? You bet they had elephants. Out here in Arizona, some of the boys from the uh, Arizona State were out on an archaeological binge, and they cut way, way down under the strata of today in an ancient area, and there they found an elephant skeleton embedded in his bone joint was, guess what? An arrowhead. The scientists scratched their heads and said, now let's see. Elephants don't shoot arrows at each other. Of course they were here contemporaneously with ancient man. This stairway over here is 300 feet wide from that point on the far left over to this point. Now compare that with the size of some of these giant buildings. They had the stone cenotes cut out of limestone, exactly the, the shape of those they've now found over in the Holy Land. And here they had cement aprons to lead the water into these uh, uh, cisterns to hold water in an area where they depend largely on rain for their water. Every building in Merida has an ancient foundation under these structures, or an ancient building, and the ancient city goes way out beyond. Did they have these highways? Everywhere we look, the highways build up from, 18 to, uh, from 8 to 12 feet above the surrounding ground to keep them high and dry if possible. The top covered with a coating of cement. Oh, my time shot. Jeepers, why am I so long-winded? These giant stones, are you willing to stay with me a few minutes? <laughs> if you have to go home to breakfast, go ahead. We'll excuse you. Nine-foot diameter stone wheels. The stone is right next to emerald in hardness. Square axle holes. The engineers today have used these stone wheels to build a weight-carrying wagon. And sure enough, they're able to pile on 300 tons of weight and with horses or elephants pulling them over these smooth cement highways. 
the main one of which is 100 to two feet, uh, 200 feet wide and stretching from sea to sea and coast to coast, and they pull them very easily. They carried over 1,000 ton weights, great distances to their buildings. Palenque, three Indians climbing the stairs, seven flights of stairs going down inside, full color uh, murals down there showing a white-skinned brother in subjection to a, to a dark-skinned brother, just like the Book of Mormon said. The first apartment house of the Americas, isn't that interesting? <laughs> 200 miles back from the coast by jungle trail. Taking an airplane out of Mexico, we fly over Monte Alban. You can tell the Latin people excavated this, they're real clever. They always leave the hardest job to last. See, the giant temple on the right hasn't been touched. The, uh, the United States engineers always do the hardest job first. That's how you can tell which is which. This building in dead center, or off the left of dead center, has a stairway on it in the center that once again is 300 feet wide. Now, I'm going to show you that from the ground in just a minute. Down at Oaxaca, where we landed, here on the base of an ancient temple is a cathedral. It has over $1 million of gold ornamentation in it, including that world-famous sunburst design. Do you know where the gold came from? Out of the ancient temple that once stood on this spot. When the Book of Mormon said they became exceeding expert in the working of gold and the making of all kind of jewelry and designs, uh, they weren't just kidding, were they? And yet every one of these Catholic cathedrals is standing on an ancient base I'm sure you're aware that Cortez in Central and Mexico, America, and in the, uh, and Pizarro in South America, every time they found the Indians worshiping at an ancient uh, temple, they forced them to tear the temple down. Some of them wouldn't do it, and they were put to death. And in place of the temple, they built over the base a Catholic cathedral. As a result, in one valley in Cholula, we have 365 Catholic cathedrals with only five Indians, as I remember, average for each cathedral today. When we ask why there were that many, one for every day in the year, they say because there were 365 ancient temples in this one small valley. Back up to Monte Alban. Again, the acoustics amazing. We're up 9,000 feet high. We could whisper a question and down at the end of this long courtyard, you could hear the question and give an answer. This fellow in the right side of center was swinging a, a, a scythe, and we could hear it as it went through the wind, as it moaned. 168 tombs had been excavated to the time I was in here on this trip, and all of these buildings have circular uh, pillars. Do you see this one here that I am pointing to? The extra wide cement joints, they pounded small stones in between joints to uh, force the cement into every uneven surface of the adjoining stone. Scientists testify that they have seen where a growing root, starting at the base of a temple with its ter tremendous force, has cracked a temple from bottom to top, in some cases 30 stories high. Yet they have never found, they testify to us, a vertical crack in the ancient cement. It will always break the stone before it breaks the cement. Isn't that amazing? Now, here's that stairway on the far left I had told you about, 300 feet wide. And down in the uh, courtyard, you can see the size of these structures from one of the cars here. Dr. Marais brought these two artifacts up out of tomb number 168. The one on the left, he says, is positively Egyptian, while the one on the right is just as certainly Hebrew. There are Hebrew markings on the back of that stone. There are Egyptian markings on the back of the other. And now I'm sure you're aware that all up and down the east coast of North America, Central America, and South America, they are finding stones with Phoenician writings on them and Hebrew writings showing that the Hebrew people were here and that they came by boat. Tomb number seven, famous tomb number seven, was filled with gold jewelry. It's been on world tour at least four times. 
And this jewelry is just out of this world. Isn't that gorgeous? Every one of those pendants is a separate little bell. When you hang it free of its backdrop, it is the singing necklace of the ancient people. The design above my head here, we found one identical to it down there in uh, uh, that giant Chon Chon city. Again, the stones are just forced in place without adhesive on backs or sides. There they've stayed all these years. Any temple you see today, Cortez thought was a hill or a mountain. Had he known it was a temple, he would have forced them to tear it down. These giant pillars, 12 of them with a super giant 13th one in the center, they are tapered from a three foot base diameter to two and a half feet at the top. They're 12 feet out of the ground, three feet into the ground. Once again, indentations top and bottom as we would hold something horizontally then in a stone cutting lathe. Everywhere we look, there are giant cities under the wings of the plains. You were close enough can see city walls everywhere you look. They excavated two buildings. Time ran out. They went on to another location because time and money was running out. In Mexico City, a giant city of many, many millions today, their buildings are sinking. They thought it was because of a marshy condition underneath. They're putting pilasters down 40 feet drilled into the earth to try to hold their foundations. It is not because of a marshy condition. There are two giant cities under the streets of Mexico City. Were you aware of that? Here we are at the corner of Guatemala and Venezuela streets. The owners of this lot drilled down here and their tools dropped into empty space. When they dug out, they found the feathered serpent, the fine quality cement, the identical angle to their pyramid side that we have out at San Juan Teotihuacan. The same stone wheels, everything depicting the Mayan Taltec people. And yet, as they drilled another 30 feet below here through volcanic debris every inch of the way, they, ca they came again to empty space and their tools dropped into emptiness. When they dug out down there, there were the artifacts and the evidences and the carbon dating of the, of the archaic people. So here we have it. The Jaredites, as the Book of Mormon calls them, on the bottom. The Nephite Lamanites, whom we now call the Mayan Taltecs in the middle. And the Mexicans on top. <laughs> yes, there is evidence. There were, there were two giant civilizations before the Mexicans. Here is the famous calendar stone taken out of the base of the temple in Mexico City, the ancient temple. It's 13 feet in diameter. It weighs 10 tons. Every insignia of the 20 named days of every month are here shown, just identical to those down there at the doorway of the sun at Tijuanaco, Bolivia. Every one of the 18 months of the year are here depicted. The difference, this is round. It has the points of the compass in dots, 360 of them, Around the outer edge, as you can see, it has the major points of the compass, and yes, the festival period in the middle, the identical festival face that we had in South America, but this adds to it the signs of the zodiac. 32 stories high. How would you like to climb that to do your worshiping? Every stone held to its neighbor was cement. Yet the base of all of these temples, the interior, is the mound work of the ancient people that carbon dates back to the time of the Tower of Babel. This is out at San Juan Teotihuacan. The one in the center here above my head dedicated to the sun god, S-O-N, the only one that has the feathered serpent insignia. There are 12 giant serpents in one place and another 13th supergiant, the 12 and one combination. They had a coating that was as much as six inches thick that I'm pointing to. He's all dolled up, isn't he? Going to a show somewhere. Uh, out now at uh, Tenuyuca, 52 serpents around three out of four sides on each of each of the three sides, 52 of them, which is their half cycle. Full cycle is 104 in the Venus calendar. Definitely Egyptian, nearby these certainly Hebrew. One 18 feet tall, the other's 20 feet tall. 
This is the oldest structure of the Americas. Carbon dates back to 2200 B.C. It's, it's at Fuquilco on the outskirts of Mexico City, yet nearby are the ruins of the people who date back to about 100 B.C. when they first came into this area. That's something to climb those steps. We had, took a guide to guide the guide here at Xochicalco. Uh, our guide got lost. Notice the human teeth again in the serpent's mouth and the feathers coming out of his head this time. When my guide in Mexico City said, uh, uh, when he heard I wanted to go into the Temple of the Rabbits, he said, oh, please, Mr. West, not in there. And I said, why? He said, the last five miles is stairways of the ancient people. I said, I've climbed all the Himalayas and the Alps and the high Sierras. Let's go. So away we went. He was out of condition, the fellow in the middle, Carlos. And he kept drinking Coca-Cola going up the trail. And I, I'm an old scout man. I've had 32 years of scouting background. And I told him, Carlos, even my young scouts know better than that. You're going to get trail sick. He got deathly sick. And yet every bend of the trail, we'd come to a Coca-Cola sign and uh, uh, Coca-Cola available. If it hadn't been for Carlos, he was sick half the way up the trail. This little wiry Indian fellow here would have, Pompeo, would have just run my legs off. I kept asking him the secret of the ancient cement. And I thought he kept saying in Spanish, the whites of eggs. I said to Carlos, ask him in the Indian tongue. He said, that's right. He says, the whites of eggs. I said, Pompeo, have you tried it? And he said in the Spanish tongue, at 75 centavos per egg? <laughs> he had quite a sense of humor, too. Well, you know, that could be one of the secrets of the ancient cement. And they also say they use blood, human blood, in their mix. Now, almost the last shot. In the Valley of Cholula, Cortez thought he had got every temple. He got 365 of them. But what he didn't know was that there was a giant pyramid under this mountain. He thought it was a mountain. When they excavated the corners, to the amazement of Dr. Gann, Dr. Thompson, T.A. Willard, and numbers of others, they found it was exactly twice the base measurement right to the inch of the largest pyramid of Egypt. Now, I've climbed all those pyramids and most of these over here, too. Or no Cadillac car has ever been before. And then we take burros to go back. Again, it took a guide to guide the guide. Our guide got lost. Way back in the heavy mountainous country of Mexico, here's this giant 300-ton Rain God Talalic monument. I leave you with this shot. It was lying on its back. We didn't take it out from this spot and put it in one of the museums of the world because modern transportation was not equal to the task of taking it out until we first built highways into it. We've since done that, and you can now see this beautiful Rain God Talalic monument standing upright in the gorgeous Museum of Anthropology in the heart of Mexico City today. They found the quarry from whence it came, 16 miles away over the most rugged Mexican mountains, these ancient people thought nothing of carrying 300 tons of weight that distance. There is the hole in a stone quarry way up high that they must have had to use ladders to get to. And then they pulled this stone after they'd cut out its outline out of that hole, made a socket then, and carted it here and carved it intricately. May the Lord bless you wonderful people, both in the church and out of the church. I plead with you, read the Book of Mormon as you never have done before, because it really is the story of the ancient people of this continent. It proves in every place you turn the Holy Bible, because it is the running mate of the Holy Bible. It's the very stick of Joseph to be the running mate of the stick of Judah or the Holy Bible. May you have a growing and, and uh, living testimony of the truth of this great work, I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.